And I would like to officially start our tour and I would like to officially welcome you at this place. We are next to Glilot Junction, which is next to Ramat Sharon, which is just a bit north of Tel Aviv, which is right behind the cinema city. Okay, better to say we are right in the center of the country. We are about maybe two kilometers or so from the beach. Okay, but right now I would like to start our tour of this place, which is the Intelligence Heritage and Commemoration Center. And the CEO is David Tour, David Tour. He is with us right now. So David, I uh, please unmute yourself. You are welcome to speak to us. Uh, good evening to the people of the East and good morning to the people in the uh, East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. Uh, I'm honored to talk to you today. And I would like to thank uh, Steve Plotkin for his initiative uh, to give me the, this platform uh, to introduce you to our center. I'm Brigadier General Reserve David Sur. I'm 67 years old. I served for more than 30 years in the military intelligence. And I'm the CEO of this uh, center for 15 years. Uh, this center is the home of the Israeli intelligence community. And it was established in the uh, beginning of the 80s, following the request of the bereaved families of the intelligence community to have a memorial site in order to commemorate the fallen of the intelligence community. The intelligence community in Israel includes the Mossad, which is, you know, very well known, you know, there are two words in the world in Hebrew that the whole world knows is Shalom and Mossad, or Mossad, as you like to say. Uh, the, the Mossad is uh, similar to the CIA. We have the Shorut Bitachon Klali, General, uh, the Israeli Security Agency, which is, we call it Shin Bet or Shabak, which is similar to FBI. And uh, we have the military intelligence. This is the home of these organizations, of the bereaved families, of the uh, retirees of these uh, 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 organizations. And we are, we are a non-profit and NGO organization. We are not governmental, but we are associated, of course, as you all can understand, with the intelligence uh, community. I would like really in a short brief uh, to introduce you to us and then I'll uh, hand over to our best guide that now stands, uh, is standing uh, next to Yulia and you will see her soon. Uh, I would say that we are based on main three pillars. Our goals our our, uh, and our aim. The first one, as you could understand, is the commemoration. The, uh, we have here a very nice monument that you will see later on. And we commemorate here more, uh, more than 750 names. And uh, we have still few names that we cannot expose to the people. Few, uh, something like dozen people, uh, mainly from the Mossad, but also from the uh, military intelligence. This is our, uh, I would say, main uh, goal here, to commemorate the, the people. And uh, we have an annual ceremony in June. June is the day of the intelligence community. June 5th, we, unfortunately, this year we couldn't uh, executed because of the uh, corona issue. Uh, but we have an annual ceremony and uh, it used to be with the prime minister uh, because the prime minister is the uh, commander of the uh, two civilian organizations of the intelligence com community. And of course, the uh, 
defense minister, chief of staff, and so forth. Uh, I would like to say that we are uh, recognized by the Ministry of Defense as a national memorial site, uh, and there is very, uh, very few memorial sites that were recognized like this. This, the, everything is uh, is backed by the Minister of Defense, and uh, we uh, we uh, make all our commemoration activities uh, following the guidelines from the Minister of Defense, the regulations, so forth, so forth. The second pillar is the heritage, and uh, as as it was mentioned, our name is the Israel Intelligence Commemoration and Heritage Center. And uh, in initials, we call us uh, double I, double C. And our father founder was General Mayor Amit, the late Mayor Amit. I don't know how many of you heard the name, but General Mayor Amit was the only one that uh, had uh, uh, the two positions of the uh, head of the military intelligence and head of the Mossad. And in 67, he was the head of the Mossad before that he was the head of the military uh, intelligence. And uh, his vision was that the uh, heritage will be part of the commemoration. And when he took over the mission to, to establish this association and to build this memorial site, he told the bereaved families that uh, we won't be just a war with names that you will come once a year for an uh, annual for the ceremony, but we want to make an active commemoration, which looks like or had, had like an oxymoron, but we are fulfilling this vision every day, unfortunately. Because of the corona, we can't do it uh, on these days. But I want to give you some characteristics of this activity. Uh, we bring here many students during the year, thousands of students, because the uh, Mayor Amit said that our main target audience will be the young generation. And the idea was to bequeath the heritage of the intelligence community in order to expose them to the values of the intelligence community, like integrity, dedication to your organization, dedication to your country, uh, what we call in Israel, in the world Zionism, all in all. And we do it mainly with the people, with the students from the peripheral areas, from the south and from the north. And, and, and also from the social periphery here in the center. We are lucky to have some donors that give us the money to rent buses. And you know, when you send a bus to the principal of the school, he will send his students, no doubt about it. He doesn't have to consider what the alternatives and which budget to use and so forth. So forth, we solved for him the, the problem. And by that, we are succeed in bringing thousands of students every year. Of course, we have also the uh, military the intelligence uh, rookies, yeah, young soldiers and young uh, uh, rookies of the other organizations. Uh, this is more professional uh, guidance uh, that we do here. And recently, as you know, the retirees, the retired people are more younger and more healthy, you know. So there we have also groups in the year and in the age of 65 and, and above. And uh, these people gives us another experience because we have some kind of interaction because they know the history. And uh, sometimes we learn new, new uh, issues or new items from them. It's very interesting. We also, of course, we hug the bereaved families uh, in, our, uh, in our activities. We have special, uh, special uh, events for them every year. 
and uh, this is uh, for us this is very important we don't give them them all the social welfare that the government give them but we give them a big hug and this is uh, we tell them that this is their home and just to uh, to give you an example we have on our board 25 people five of them 20% are representatives of the bereaved family. So this is the, the main activity of the heritage. And the third pillar is research. And we have here small three research centers. First one is the heritage uh, center that feeds all the activities that uh, that are connecting to the uh, issue of the heritage and we try to, uh, to learn uh, lessons and to feed the new people in the organizations with lessons from the past. For instance, we take a, an issue that you will uh, be exposed later on uh, and we, we uh, analyze it and we, uh, we uh, also, we send the lessons or they participate in, in, in some kind of uh, event, the active people, and uh, we, exp we expose them and we uh, present the uh, lessons that we learned. The second one, which I highly recommend to you to visit our website, is the ITIC, it's the in Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center, named after Mayor Amit. You can write in Google Mayor Amit Center, M-E-I-R-A-M-I-T, as you heard it, and you will, be, uh, you will see our website. Our website is in, now it's in four languages. It used to be in seven uh, languages or even eight languages, including Farsi and Arabic. But everything is, is in Hebrew and in English. And you can, uh, you will be uh, exposed to what's going on regarding the terror here in the neighborhood, and I mean the Middle East, the global jihad, what's going on in Iran, not the nuclear issue, but what's going on in Iran, what's going on in Syria, what is going on in Lebanon now, what what is happening after the uh, explosion in Beirut, and so forth, so forth. In this website, we have 300,000 visitors every month. And if there is any tension here, like an operation in Gaza Strip or in Lebanon, it, it, uh, it grows up to uh, 750, uh, 100,000 people. And uh, you will get the a very accurate information of what's going on. It's not a propaganda website. It's very professional. It's based on a, an analyst who served many years in the intelligence community. They take the facts and uh, they do their work. I can give you just a small example of their, of their uh, contribution to the security of Israel. So, if you remember the Turkish flotilla issue around 10 years ago, and uh, you know the, um, the media, including the American media, they blamed Israel to be aggressors and so forth, so forth. One of our analysts found out that in 1998, a guy from the organization that organized the flotilla IHS, the Turkish IHS, they made a terror activity in Lux, in LA airport in 1998. Your media, you know, the American media, they check it, they found out this is true, and they turn, you know, in 180 degrees. So Israel, they understood that this is not an innocent people that wants to help their brothers in uh, Gaza. And it was more no tricky. Uh, David, the third. David, hi. I must I must apologize, but we need some time for the tour. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, okay. okay. One, one sentence. The, th the third uh, institute, the third research center is uh, the research of methodology of the, pro of the uh, intelligence. This is very professional, so I won't get to it. I hope you will enjoy the tool that you will, sh sh you will see now, you will watch, and I wish you all the best, a lot of health and prosperity. Thank you very much. David, thank you so, so much for your introduction. I would love to have more of this, and I would love to give you special time for a special presentation, and then I will keep totally quiet. But right now, we're about to start the tour. We have a question here. Yes, uh, so we, we will repeat the name of the site. It is called the Intelligence Heritage and Commemoration Center, and it's located right by Gililo Junction. Uh, oh, the internet side, sorry. Okay, uh, the internet side, we will have a special slide in the end of the tour, and you will have the name. In the meanwhile, if you just Google uh, Meir Amit Center, that will do. Meir Amit Center. All right? Okay. So right now, I would like to introduce our wonderful, wonderful guide. Hi, Nina. Hi. And, uh, yeah. And uh, I'm so, so pleased uh, to have Nina as our guide. And uh, I was guided by her. And I can tell you that she's just the best. So I will give her the microphone. And we are on our way to the tour, which will have quite a few stops. And the first stop will take place at here. All right. I hope you can see it well enough. And I would like you to see that it looks a bit like a maze. And this is what it is called. It is the memorial maze. And it's does look like a brain, a human brain, because intelligence is all about brain, not muscles. So, Nina, it's all yours. Thank you very much. You have been hearing the Vitsu Commander, and as a devoted officer to the intelligence service, I'm going to prove on the field everything that he has been talking about. Uh, I served as an officer in the intelligence service. And um, when we had started this project to open ourselves to the public, it was about 12 years ago, we started with children from peripheral area of Israel, bringing those children to us on our account. We paid the bus, as David Su told you, and sometimes we paid the meal. We started this project with something between, something between six to eight activities a month during the scholar year. Now, last year, before the corona, we achieved 70 activities a month. And it includes not only children, not only adults. Last year, I have received more than 37 countries coming and visiting us. What I'm going to show you now in about uh, half an hour it's a tour of something between five to six hours that is made in here, because what do we have to present in here? It's the commemoration center and the inheritance, as you have heard from the Bitsu. I will pass through the labyrinth, the labyrinth, the memorial wall of the, in the memorial of our member from the Mossad, the Shabak, internal security, and the army, all those members that died away during their service. On the wall we have 763 names. We can publish only part of them. As you probably heard, we have something like a dozen person that we cannot yet mention the names. Other that we can mention the names, we cannot show the pictures. Why? For many reasons. Anyhow, those members, when I'll be passing through the labyrinth to show you the names, you are going to see that all the names of the labyrinth are written the same. It doesn't matter if it's a soldier that died in a car accident or the head of Sayeret Matkal. Sayeret Matkal is a very special unit of the intelligence service and they are written the same. You're going to see that every name 
have a date that he passed away. We know the day, we know the month, and we know the year. Some of them, we know only the year because they, dis they have disappeared from our life and we know nothing about it. The entrance of the labyrinth, there is a wall and it's written on it. In secrecy, they have done their job. Sometimes we know nothing about their life and sometimes nothing about their death. To the memory of all those that we cannot yet reveal the names and say something about their history. The labyrinth is divided in rooms. Each room is a period. This is the first room. And you can see on this room, you can have an idea how the, all the names are written the same and the date. And for example, we have here at the end a name, Muhammad Qasem Said Ahmed. You know that he's not a Jew. We have many members of the Jews, Jews community here in Israel and they are very loyal and their integrity is very well known all over the world. I would like to pass to another room because I would like to point some of the deeds that our members have done. For example, you know, intelligence service exists all over the world. There is something that is, that is very, very special to our intelligence service. It's something that doesn't exist in any other country in the world. You cannot guess it, but Israel, the intelligence service of Israel, even before the creation of the state of Israel, they have done a lot to save people all over the world. Can you imagine Jews, how do they look during the Second World War, trying to escape from the ghetto, arriving to the concentration camp? And can you imagine how do they look when they are out of the concentration camp? No shoes, no clothes, no address, no name, nothing at all. And we, we started to help them before that, during the war, we had the brigade, people that joined the British army, but all over Europe, they were looking for those Jews and to help them and to bring them. Here we have a name of a person, Shalom Danny Weiss. Shalom Danny Weiss, he himself was in a concentration camp in Austria. But when he was liberated, he joined the unit that we are very proud of. It's a unit that forged documents. Shalom Danny Weiss was a member of this unit that gave identity cards or passport to those Jews that, we, that escaped from Europe during the Second World War and after that. And uh, he, even, he has uh, forged a very special passport. The name on the passport is Dan Zev Zichorni. You know nothing about it, and it's a fake name. But this passport helped somebody very known all over the world. He left Argentina, this man, with this name, Zev Zichorni, and landed in Israel as Adolf Eichmann. When we had to bring Adolf Eichmann to Israel, we needed to prove by a passport of someone that went in in order to be going out. Anyhow, it proves that what we have done even before the creation of the, of the State of Israel, all the intelligence service that tried to help Jews all over the world and to bring them to Israel. And by the way, here you see two names, Rafael ben Gera and Yaakov Hassan, two persons that disappeared from our life and we know nothing where, how, and when. Okay? The, the other part of, the, of this um, wall, um, Eli Cohen. Eli Cohen was uh, our secret warrior in Damascus. Eli Cohen was condemned to death on 65, 18 of May 65. But two years after, when the Six Days War started, it was a great success due to the information that we have received with him. By the way, many members that worked in Arab lands, and with another story, and not their personality, like Eli Cohen and many others, um, I can give one example of my father, that um, when we were in Damascus, I think that probably you have heard who is Bin Laden, and you have heard who is Yasser Arafat, but you never heard about a name, a man called Fawzi al Kawuji. Fawzi al Kawuji on the 30th has created an army to fight against Israel, and we had in Israel a lot of problems. The story of my father, the undercover that he was in, he created a factory 
and he sold the uniform to the army of Fauzi el Kaoubji. And that's how, on March 37, my father was able to send to Israel a letter with all the villages and the kibbutzim that are going to be attacked by the army of Fauzi el Kaoubji. This just to show you what kind of information those people that worked in Arab lands were able to send to Israel, to the security of Israel. And this is Eli Cohen, for example. As I told you before, the um, head of Sayeret Matkal, Yonatan Netanyahu, his name on the wall is exactly like the other names on the wall. Uh, the story of Entebbe, I don't, know, I don't know if you have seen the movie. Anyhow, on, 70, on, on uh, 76, on July 76, a plane of Elal, of uh, Air France, was kidnapped to Uganda. And um, Idi Amin of Uganda before that, he was a very good friend of Israel before that. But later on, he has decided to join the terrorist activity. And uh, when this plane landed in Uganda, they separated the Jews from the others, and all our citizens, all the Jews were, were uh, apart, and the terrorists started to argue to see if they can exchange them for their prisoners in Israel. We have decided to free those people. We knew exactly how the airport is built because we have built it. As I said, when Idi Amin was a very good, uh, very good friend of Israel, we helped him to build this airport. But we needed to know what's happening on real time. And a member of the Mossad, probably, with a passport, for sure not Israeli, he flew to Uganda. He rented a small plane because he was also a pilot. And he arrived to the airport. And um, he came, he arrived to the airport and asked to land there. He said that he hears strange noises from the engine and he needs to refuel. But the member in the, in the airport said that this airport is closed. He cannot land in there. He started to argue with them. And while talking and arguing, he took pictures. And those pictures were sent directly to Sayyid Matkal, this commander unit of the Interior Service, preparing all the, all, all the, the operation in Uganda. And on the 4th of July, 76, they arrived to Uganda uh, with a black Mercedes like uh, Idi Amin had, and they were able to free those people and to bring them back to Israel. And by the way, an anecdote that I would like to, to tell you, this pilot that landed in the airport at, at the end, uh, he was so friendly with them, they tried to convince him to be Idi Amin's private pilot. Well, he was not, but another Israeli was. So uh, something like that can help a lot. So this is Yonatan Netanyahu. Um, I told you before that a tour here is longer than that. Doing the tour of the labyrinth with the names on the wall and their stories, and some of them, believe me, can make you smile and even laugh. At the end of it, we have a very special place. We have a very special synagogue that can tell you the story, the special story of the intelligence service. And this synagogue can connect two things. Not only what we have done to save those Jews, but also to give you an aspect of our tradition. And from all the places that we have brought Jews to Israel, we have brought also pieces of Judaica from them. And this special, very special synagogue that we have in here, by the way, it does help the bereaved families coming here for the Memorial Day. And here, as you can see, it's a very small synagogue, and we have everything in it. What I would like to enlarge in this synagogue is a story of saving Jews all over the world. What Israel has done, no other country has ever done. We brought those Jews from North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, and from Iran, and from Egypt, and Syria, and Lebanon, and lately also from Ethiopia. And... Um, from, as I said, from all the places that we have brought the Jewish community, we have brought 
also pieces of Judaica. And by the way, when I was talking about Shalom Dani Weiss, this is Adolf Eichmann as a navigator. That's how he made him as a navigator. And this is the passport of Adolf Eichmann. That's how we were able to bring him to Israel. By the way, something else that I would like to add in here, and I know that you are going to receive it lately with another Zoom that will come to you. Every, all the members here, um, each one of us has a story. And we have many stories, and you will hear people that will reveal themselves and what they have done. For example, in the story of Entebbe, one of our officers is also a member. Um, he, he takes part as a volunteer here. And um, he will tell you his own story later on, not today, but in a, any other day. Anyhow, most, the most touching story that we have about saving Jews was done, has been done by the head of the Mossad, Tzvika Zamir. On the 80s, we bought a service, the service of a Lebanese fisherman. And every time and then he used to bring one or two families in his small fishing boats, taking them out the territorial water of Syria or of Lebanon. And the units from the Navy used to wait for them and bring them to Israel. One day, we knew that a boat has to arrive. The unit went. They waited more than two hours and nobody came. They called Hypersport to see what to do, to do, and they have been told to return back, probably a problem in the port of Beirut. A couple of hours later, later, there was a call from the sea saying, we have arrived and nobody came toward us. And by coincidence, the head of the Mossad, because Amir was there, and he has decided to go with them, to, toward them. Usually the unit went with a very small boat. The head of the Mossad is not permitted to take a small boat. He went with a warship. I don't know who was near a warship lately from your part. It's something very big very strong, very noisy, terrifying. And this story is told by the head of the Mossad with tears in his eyes. He said when he came near these small fishing boats, he looked from up there down, and he saw a family with two kids, terrified to death. Like her, they were sitting one into the other. They were so afraid, they were waiting for something small, and suddenly this huge and big and noisy instrument stopped in front of them. Shrikas Amir stood up there, waved his hand, and shouted in Hebrew, Shalom, Ani Chayal Israeli, hello, I'm an Israeli soldier. They were not able to hear, they were so afraid. And he passed to Arabic. He shouted in Arabic, and they joined the Israeli. But they were more afraid, because they heard Arabic from up there. And Shrikas Amir is not a religious man. He stood up there, and he shouted the Shema Israel, the most known prayer that we have. And as they heard the word of this prayer, they knew that they had arrived at the right place. I don't think that you'll ever see a head of a certain Mossad from any other country going by himself to bring one Jewish family from Syria and opening their heart with the Shema Israel. Now I would like to show you some of the pieces of Torah. One of them, the small one, to come and see it. The small one was saved from the Holocaust. They brought him to Israel, and this book, this Sefer Torah, this Bible, the family named Kaplan, because this family has four members on our wall, three officers and one woman that was my secretary. And the other one is one of 11 books that have been brought, me when I say, brought lately. When I say lately, it's something about 30 years ago. We brought 11 books from Damascus. It is the youngest of them. We brought another 10, including Keter Aram Tsova, 1,100 years old. So from all those places that we have brought the Jewish community, we made an effort to bring the pieces of Judaica with them. Okay? Now I would like to take you to some other places that David Sur has mentioned. David Sur has mentioned that we have a research unit in here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I just uh, 
I, uh, I'm trying to convince Nina to tell you a little bit about her personal story, about her family, which actually has much to do with the forest crawl we just saw. So Nina, would you please share with us? Okay. I thought they would give me another hour, but they won't. <laughs> my special story is that my father was a member if I can call it the Mossad, anyhow, it was called the Shai, the intelligence service before the creation of the State of Israel. My family, my family has done a lot to help Jews escape from Syria and later on from Lebanon. And uh, on the end of 50 December, my father has decided to send six small fishing boats with people in them to Israel. In one of the boats where my brother, my sister and my grandmother, my brother and my sister were this time, my, my sister was 10 years old, my brother nine years old, and the leader of those people that helped smuggling those people to Israel because they were very, very well paid, uh, has decided to, to do something uh, glorious. And this uh, glorious thing that he has done, he killed my brother, my sister, my grandmother, he threw the body to the sea and escaped to Gaza Strip where well, those people were accepted as heroes that came to Gaza. Uh, David Ben Gurion, the Prime Minister at this time in Israel, has given an order not to mention the affair that people are escaping from Lebanon or to mention the name of my father. But later on, on 53, three years after, the Mossad has done the impossible and has brought us as a family to Israel, my father, mother, my brother, and me. And, um, you know, I don't want to enlarge this subject because I hope that no one of you will ever be had the um, experience of uh, living with a bereaved family. And uh, that's why the bereaved family that we have in here, we are getting, taking very, very good care of them. And just one thing that I have started with them is when I have people from high school, children from high school coming here, I ask usually if they do have someone from their school that passed away or from the neighborhood or the family, I connect them to the family and they come sometimes with them in here. And you have to see those kids with a guitar, with something that they read, something very touching, and uh, the families take part in this uh, reunion that they make on the memory of their beloved, okay? So I just uh, like to add that, as you know, we are a very small country and we are a very small nation, us, meaning the Jews. And therefore, you know, it's a it's well-known joke that two Israelis, they necessarily, if they don't know each other, so they have somebody in common, they both know. And same is true for grief, you know, if you've never lost somebody in your family, your immediate family, so you know somebody who did. And so this commemoration center, I mean, even, even if you don't have anybody who ever served in the intelligence or the Mossad, but you are connected to it in a way because we are a very small um, nation, you know, and it, it means so much to us. So Nina, thank you for sharing your story. And just before I give you the microphone back, um, I would like to mention that the forest scroll you just saw, the one which was smuggled from Damascus, this forest scroll used to be in Nina's house. And as a child, as you told me a week ago when I did the preliminary tour here, um, you were touching this forest scroll, you were holding this forest scroll, mm -hmm. and years and years later, the same forest scroll made it to the synagogue of the Heritage Center. And Nina can see it again. You know, this is, uh, this is sort of a Jewish miracle, I would say. So, it's all right. Um, I would like to take you to the second station in here. Uh, the program here is a modular program. We have five stations. We have the commemoration center, and in the heritage, we have two museums: the Museum of the Intelligence Service, the story of the first drone. I don't know if you know that, but Israel was the pioneer in the field of the drone, and the Museum of the Terrorist Activity. We have a very, very special library 
we pass through it. But we have something else, as I said, when we have a group, we have some of, one of us that reveal himself and reveal his story. But I would like to tell you something else that we are special in it. We have here, between us, between the volunteers, we have children with special needs. And believe me, some of them are genius. One of them, a professor from the University of Haifa once, asked me to receive a little bit of information about what's happening in Iran, everything that has been published. One of the kids that sent him the material and this professor called me and he said, I never received such good information. And those kids, some of them are in special houses. And when I want to bring them to us, we do close all these places. And when the place is closed, I bring them. And it's fantastic to see those people coming in here, very interested, asking questions. And those kids that never open themselves outside, here they feel at home. Well, speaking of questions, guys, I just uh, like to remind you that if you have any questions, so you're welcome to write it on chat, and then we will answer. Okay, now, on the way to the library, I, by the way, I would like to show you something else that we have in here, each one that is mentioned on the wall, each person, each soldier or woman that are mentioned on the wall, each one has an album. Some of the albums are without a picture. Other albums that we cannot mention the name are in a different place. Just to tell you something, that the most touching picture that I have ever seen, I received one day a very family that comes here and what they have brought with them is a picture of the new bones and they wanted to put the nephews, the grandchildren or the children of someone that's full, and they do put those pictures in the album, again, to create the whole story of this person that passed away. Uh, uh, we have a question here. How long uh, must uh, they you know, wait until uh, you can release names of people who have died? Um, not only one answer. Let's suppose that sometime, someone passed away uh, and he has been working with a group in a certain country. All the time that those people are still there, we cannot publish the picture because they can connect him with his hands in this country. So we cannot show the picture of this man, just to know, not to show his friend that he's been working there. Others that have achieved a very high position at a certain place, probably sometimes the place that they were, they knew nothing about who they were. And uh, we prefer to leave them in the darkness, not to show that this person that passed away with another name, well, they will not know what he has been doing there and what he has done with. Anyhow, we have many reasons. Sometimes a member has a family abroad. We have few Jews all over the world, and sometimes if we can mention a name, they can find his family outside the border of Israel. As I said, not all the members here are Jew. We have other religions. So we cannot publish a name if his family is still abroad. Um, Nina, there was a question about the album. Uh, can the public, suppose the center is open and no pandemic, can the public can actually come in here and see the albums, examine the albums? A tour here, well, you have to adjust days before. Why? Because a visit here cannot be without a guide. You have to receive the information from the Inherited Center and the Commemoration Center. The albums also, if a guide is with you, you can open every album, you can sit and read, and anyhow, in the internet, uh, the web of the IICC, you can see all the names and you can read a lot. And uh, we are going to give you the web of the library 
In this web also, you can read a lot of information about the per person that are mentioned on the wall. Uh, and then another question regarding the album. Do they belong to Mossad agents or other... <laughs> All, all the members here, we are all high ranked officers from the Mossad, the Shabbat, and the army. By the way, I think that Mossad, Shalom, and Hallelujah are the most Hebrew words known all over the world. So here, all of them are mentioned in here. We can put in the album information that uh, uh, can be revealed. Some of the albums are with uh, Formations that we cannot yet reveal, but later on, when we find it necessary, we have here somebody, one of the volunteers, his name is Moti. He is the one to take care of those albums, and he does add sometimes the information needed to add to those albums. Anyhow, the information can be read. This place is open to the public. You can come here, you can see the albums, you can see all the museum, but the only thing that you need with it is a guide to explain to you what you are going to see. I'm on my way now to the library. It's a very, very special library. We have here a lot of documents that we, you cannot see in any other places. But what's also very special in this library, she is connected, this library is connected to the research unit that we have in here. And we publish every day a lot of information when you will receive the web of this library, you'll be able to read all what we are publishing every day. Here, I am in front of a lot of documents in here. This document that you are going to see now is a daily document. And, can you get it? and the information is in six different languages. And, uh, you heard about uh, the Vitsu telling you about the Marmara, about uh, the report of uh, lawyer Goldston from South Africa that was forced from Turkey. The research unit from here is the one that have pointed that all those people that were on the Marmara were uh, terrorist activists. And this is just an example of what we are publishing. Anyhow, anyhow you in the web of the library, you can read all this information daily. And if you send your mail, they will be able to send you every day what we are publishing in here. After, after the library, I'm going to take you, I said that we have two, we have two museums, the Museum of the Interior Service, and there I need a whole day just to tell you and to explain to you how we are acting the ability to listen, the ability to take pictures, the ability, ability to create a double agent, etc., etc. It's very long, and I hope that I will have the occasion to tell you later on about it. But the Museum of the Terrorist Activity, I would like to show you only a very special aspect of the war of, that we are having now with the terrorism. It's not a problem. It's not only the problem of Israel. I think that fighting an army is something very simple because it has been done many, many times. But fighting terrorism is something very difficult. It's not an army. The terrorist activity has completely other aspects. And especially what we are now facing here in Israel, fighting terrorism, it's something that can be unbelievable. First of all, those people that are doing the terrorist activity, they are brainwashed. Um, their religion, their belief, what they are doing is something sacred. They also called hating Israel, hating Judaism, the sacred hatred. I would like to show you some aspects of their belief or their understanding, their, their knowledge. Here we have maybe more than 15 maps from Arab countries. This one is the only one that Israel is mentioned. All the others, I can show you all the other, all the maps from Arab countries, 
Israel doesn't exist. By the way, we have a kind of a small movie with a two year and a half kid. And the father asked him all the capitals of the whole world. Believe me, he knows more than me. All the capitals of the world. And when he asked what's the capital of Israel, this kid said, Mafish Israel, Israel doesn't exist. So all those maps, still in high school, in university, Israel doesn't exist. I would like to mention something that per perhaps you are not aware of. If I'll ask you a question, what was here only 103 years ago, until 917, what was here? It was the Ottoman Empire that existed in the Middle East for something between 400 to 500 years. All the Middle East was Turkish, was the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire failed on, um, in a war on 1717 against England and France. Um, I just want to make sure that I understood correctly. This is a map which has uh, the red names in Arabic, okay. and these are the names of the villages which do not exist. They don't exist. Okay, they don't exist. So this is actually a map which was true before 1948. And well, even without reading Arabic, we are talking about villages which are Arab, which do not exist, and there are no Jewish villages here, right? No present day? Nothing at all. What they have, the Jewish uh, villages or places, well, they doesn't exist. And it's not a very old map. It's something that lately was made and every year they renew the, the map of it. So in the high school and universities, when they learn history and ge geography, they know nothing about what's happening now. For them, Israel doesn't exist. I was telling about this kid that knows all the, the capitals. Mephish Israel, Israel does not exist. Well, they are taught to be like that. And you know, the problem with fighting terrorism is when they can do their act from hospital, from high school, from neighborhood, and we cannot, we can do nothing because this kind of war is something that is really humanly, humanly it's impo impossible to try and hit back a hospital or a school from, their, from where they have launched all um, um, the material toward Israel is something very, very difficult to fight with it. And about the suicide bomber that you see here, one of the picture, his picture is like, he, it's, he's, mar he's, he's a groom. It's like he was doing. Why? Because they do believe that if he is a Shahid, sometimes somebody that has tried to kill himself, to commit suicide while killing other people, and it can be children or women or anything else, anyhow, they believe that a good place is waiting for, you in, uh, for him in heaven and that his family is going to get a lot of money. So uh, you have kids living like a suicide bomber. Anyhow, believe me, fighting terrorism, it's, some, it's something that they're very difficult. We are sometimes with hands tied because we cannot do nothing. It's a kind of war that is very hard to deal with. Hard. It's, it's, it's easy to fight a tank or a plane, but not a belief and not uh, somebody that his brain watched to, for his conception to see us as people that don't have the right to exist in the Middle East. And uh, by the way, what I can show you in here, something else that I would like to show you. You know, one day a young girl asked me, uh, do you think that those people from Gaza, they do love the land of Israel? I said, uh, they think so. And she said, I don't understand. So why they are burning the land? Somebody that loves the land cannot burn the land. He has to plant in this land and not to burn it. 
So it's a, they are very far from loving this land of Israel if they are burning it. Here you can see one way of burning what we have now in the south, south of Israel. It's one of the kites that has arrived to Israel. And usually they are with uh, something that can make all this fire in the south of Israel near the Gaza Strip or sometimes with explosive on it that arrived till Beersheba or other country. And uh, just to, to describe an image with this uh, kite, um, my daughter is married to a member from Kibbutz Nirim. Kibbutz Nirim is on the border of Gaza Strip. And exactly a year ago, exactly this day, the 23rd of August, we were celebrating my grandson, his 11 years birthday. We were in the kibbutz, they were in the swimming pool, the barbecue was outside and the fruit and the cake, and in the sky, a lot of balloons and kites, and the children from the swimming pool were looking up there, trying to guess each kite or each balloon. It depends how high he is and the wind, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where he is going. So I don't think that a contradictory picture like this one, people celebrating birthday and uh, happy balloons around them, around them, and some balloons in the sky and kites with fire. Um, as you can see, guys, right here we have some uh, leaflets, some some information provided to us by. Uh, Yad, whoever it is, uh, and, uh, you can see that it has Hebrew translation to English. I will not translate the whole thing, but basically it starts with uh, the land is our land and Jerusalem is our capital. And you, well, that's in Hebrew, so you, the Jews, you are just a guest there. And if you will not leave on your own, we will force you to leave. And then it goes on and on. And then it ends with, we will keep struggling. We will uh, keep fighting to death because we know that we will win. And um, well, the uh, victory is our destiny. By the way, there is a, it is definitely a Google Translate, so, so it's not correct Hebrew, but this is what they wanted to say. And uh, we are free. You have no power over us. So that's the information sent again and again, over and over again. Around, those are all the things that have launched to us. Everyone who put the date and the place where we received it. But you know, I would like to finish this tour with something that you will be proud of hearing about it. Um, I don't know, have you heard about Karin A? Karin A was a ship, a huge ship, that left Iran toward the Gaza Strip. It was a time when our Prime Minister Ehud Barak was talking peace with Yasser Arafat. And we believed Yasser Arafat that he is serious, he's going to make peace with us. But we knew about the ship, we knew about it from our member that was in Iran. And we started to follow this ship from Iran toward Gaza. And in every port, this ship stopped and chanted the flag, and, but we were behind it. It was January 2001, and we wanted to come as near as possible to this ship to climb up and to capture it. We knew exactly how many people are in it. And by the way, the people that were in the ship, most of them knew nothing about what, is there, what, there, what was as uh, arms in it. And uh, gathering information is something very, very important. The power of knowledge is something very important. And by the way, a tour here, we have a 35 minutes movie showing the power of knowledge. How from the time that we have seen, we have seen that a terrorist activity is on the way until we have um, gathered all the information and we, are, we were able to stop it, how the Mossad, the Shabak, and the army are working together to do it. Anyhow, returning to the ship, 
we knew that in the Red Sea by night, there is a couple of hours, that, a couple of minutes that the wind changed its course. And we, with the help of the wind, we turned the engine off of the small boat, small boat that were behind the ship. And with the help of the wind, we came as near as possible, we climbed up. And I don't know if you believe me, I hope you'll come here and see the disc, the movie. Six minutes and six seconds, and the ship was ours. Just by collecting information and knowing exactly the time that we can come as near as possible to the ship to climb up and to capture it. And uh, if to give you another example of the power of knowledge, uh, I promised Julia that I can make you smile a little bit. My first <laughs> commander in the army, we used to call him Bieber. He was the Evbar Lavi, his name. He was a specialist of Jordan. And uh, King Hussein from Jordan, even before the Six Days War, he used to take his speedboat from Aqaba to Israel. And the units from the Navy used to wait for him and bring him to Israel. And he had many friends in Israel, even he, when he came to Israel, he said many times, I would like to meet Bieber because he knows about me more than I know about myself. And just to give you one small example, uh, when the Six Days War started and uh, we captured an officer from Jordan and the best interrogators went to question him, and, but he said nothing. They sent Bieber to him. At the beginning, Bieber was telling him what he knows about Jordan, and this officer had only, the only thing that he did was nodding in the head. He was listening, he was studying. And the interrogators wanted to stop the interrogation. But then Bieber asked for another minute and he asked this man, tell me, do you drink alcohol? So this officer from Jordan said in Arabic, no, by God, I don't drink alcohol, I am Muslim. So we were asking, so how come that every month you meet your friend and he gave the exact place where the meeting is. You eat and you drink and you return drunk at home. What kind of Muslim officer are you if once a month you are drunk? This is the power of knowledge. Breaking somebody, making him talk, it can be softly and gently by knowing a lot about, about him. Okay? So you're talking about the uh, power of brain and not the power of muscles. And this is exactly, this is exactly what we began with as we started walking towards the uh, memorial complex. It's about the brain, it's not about the muscles. The brain and the... Uh, the brain and, uh, you know, kind of conception. <laughs> Uh, her name was Mona Anna, an Arab. She convinced the young boy in Israel to meet her. And uh, he met her and she took him to her friends and they killed him. And we caught her from the internet, but we needed to know what happened to him and who killed him. You know what made her talk? Cosmetic treatment. She was a tomboy, not very beautiful, etc., etc., And she even fell in love with one of the interrogators. She used to draw her a heart with his name and her name. But she took her to a hairdresser and um, something on the face, you know, taking hair from the leg and mustache, etc., etc. And when she looked in the mirror, she found another person. So the tomboy and the one that insists, etc., etc. Sometimes you can convince in this way, not being rough, but making yeah. people feel differently. Sure, this is a good point, ladies and gentlemen. Nina, I would like to thank you so very much. We have a few more questions, if it's okay. okay. All right, so we have a few questions here, which actually started with the albums, and then we, we moved away, so I want to be back to it. So starting with uh, the albums, uh, there was a question. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so uh, yes, we answered about uh, these are not just former members of the Mossad, but other intelligence pillars as well. How many women are represented at the museum? 
at the museum. Mm-hmm. No, no, in the memorial. Yes, yeah, the memorial. It's a third, approximately, isn't it, Moti? Moti is the one who is responsible. How many women? I think third of the people. Less than that? I don't know exactly. Not the exact, but I know it's. Uh, I'll tell you a third. But I tell you something. Uh, usually, women until certain date, they worked in the office, secretary, librarian, etc., etc., making the research of the Mossad, etc., etc. It's only lately that women are more active. So those women, we cannot reveal them yet. We have two only. They have done something very, very special. They were a member, member of those, this group that has created a very nice place in Sudan in order to help people from Ethiopia, to bring them to North Sudan and then to Israel. And two, those two are still volunteers between us. And if you decide to come to Israel, I'd be glad to bring those women and you will be able to hear their story. It's a fantastic story. And uh, I hope that one of them will be able to give you one hour of her story. Uh, well, Yulia, let me interfere for a minute. I would like to update you that recently, for the first time, a woman was uh, nominated as the intelligence officer of the Central Regional Command. She's a full colonel and she has to deal with all the Palestinian problems in the Judea and Samaria. And this is uh, really, uh, uh, I would say, something that we never had. We had a division uh, intelligence officer and now a central command and it's, it's fabulous. It's fabulous. And women within the intelligence fields, they can do just as men do. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for the update. And yes, I never doubted that women are as clever, or better to say, more clever than you guys. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a lady, so I can, uh, yeah. No, All right. So, saying in Spanish. In Spanish, there is a saying that the man is the head, mm-hmm. but the woman is the throat. Let. without it. Every language has something to say about it. Okay. In the research Well, we have to solve the problems that we are living in. We have a huge problem with the terrorist activity from Gaza Strip and from Lebanon, from Hezbollah. Those are the two fronts that we are dealing with. Well, and the Iranian, Iranian penetration to the middle. Those are, we hope that many countries, even Arab countries, will change a little bit the idea about Israel. And we hope that we are in a new era, a new age. But the terrorist activity, the world has to believe it's not the problem only of Israel, it's the problem of the whole world. And uh, if you can read newspapers from Europe lately, from Anyhow, one year ago, uh, they had more, um, they have received, first of all, really good help from Israel. But what has happened in England, in Belgium, in France, in Canada, in Australia, was larger than in Israel. All right, thanks. Um, All right, Uh, there is, wait, there is an interesting question. Um, Are there any restrictions on who can visit the museum? How does the museum, okay, the answer is no. So the next part of the question is, how does the museum prevent giving out valuable information to enemies of Israel? Julia, Julia, why don't you move to another location and get better sound? All right, okay, okay. So if this is not a good enough sound, so we will get outside, okay? Bonus Thank you. So, all right, so we are moving outside. Thanks for letting us know. And uh, we are about to get downstairs and answer the question. Also, Ego wanted to say a few words. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can. I hope the other can people will. Okay, so uh, my name is Ira Zaidenstein and I represent the Israel Intelligence Heritage and Commemoration Center in the United States. And I want to to Mr. Florin and Julia for arranging so quick this, uh, this uh, gathering, Zoom gathering. And we recently started our activities in the United States and we are in the process of uh, establishing American Friends Organization of the Israel Intelligence Heritage and Commemoration Center. Mm -hmm. And if any of you want to involve hosting events, donating, having presentations, please um, contact me. Um, i give you another. It's telephone is 310-502-1719. Repeat, uh, 310 Five zero two one seven one nine, and also I will send a text to everyone. Have it so if everyone need more information about the center, please um, give me a call or email me, and I will be happy to tell more. And hopefully we we'll get involved. Thank you, Igal. Thank you. Thank you, Igal. Okay, so we are back to the question, and again, the second part of the question was how do you present giving out valuable information from the museum? First of all, as I have told you, the program here is modular. It's not only modular in station because some groups, uh, six hours is too much for them. Uh, we can, we organize the tour depending the time and the character of the group that is coming here. You believe me that I cannot tell children of 16 or 17 years old the same story that I tell adult people or tourists that come to Israel. We have many ways of uh, telling the stories and uh, giving a description of what we are doing in here. For example, about the terrorist activity, just to give you one very simple uh, uh, answer. Uh, sometimes I have people that come here and I have only 15 minutes of high I like just to show you to show them some picture and 15 minutes is enough but if I have people that are more interested I can bring professor and high officer that can give a lecture of two hours and even more than that about terrorism etc etc so we know what we can tell and we know what not to tell and uh, we, are, we don't lie but we shut up <laughs> okay, I hope that answers the question. Um, all right, how many intelligence, how many names represented in the memorial? So that was uh, 763 names, which can be published, meaning that there were more casualties, uh, but we, we cannot yet tell their names. Uh, the, the question now is, why doesn't Israel blow the kites and balloons back to where they came from? Um, first of all, it's very difficult uh, because the wind has worked. We have now a new material that will laser one, uh, but it can, be, it can help in a very small area. We have to add some others that will be all along the border. Uh, it's not very simple. Secondly, those people that are doing with those balloons, they work mid um, schools, places where a lot of civilians are living in there. And uh, we, as I said before, our hands are tied. We cannot do anything not to harm people, uh, civilian, children, women in those places. Those are the places that are, they, were, they work for them. So this is another kind of war, you know, doing such a war. Uh, you know what, just to give you another example of their way of thinking, I think you have heard a lot about all those tunnels, Israel from Lebanon to Israel. You know how much money they spend spent on them, if they take only part of money, they can build hospitals, school, anything that they need. But they prefer give all the money that they are receiving to build material to harm and to burn 
and to continue the war. And uh, the question of the balloon and the kite, uh, something a bit difficult, but you know, it cannot destroy Israel. It's not very easy. It's not very easy to see those fields black, but we are still alive. And uh, they cannot change anything in the map or situation in the Middle East by doing it. They can just show how unhuman they are. And as this little daughter, this little girl said, somebody that loves the land doesn't burn the land. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I guess we've answered the questions and uh, we are way beyond our usual tour time, as usual. So I would like to thank Nina again. Thank you so much. And this let me tell something. But what Yulia had said, if I'm a lady once said, that for so many years we have been quiet between ourselves, talking between ourselves, now that we have the authorization to talk, you have to stop us. <laughs> well, unfortunately, this is exactly what I should do now, but it's not because I'm not fascinated. And um, guys, what, what Nina mentioned before about this amazing, crazy operation for saving the Ethiopian Jews through Sudan, there is a movie about this very story, which yes. is called uh, The Red Sea Diving love or something something yeah, similar yeah something something similar to that and you know truth is more fascinating than the movie and uh we might bring one of these amazing women who participated in this action to talk to you later uh we actually were thinking um well i can uh you know share with you uh steve and myself we were thinking what should be the next presentation about the Mossad actions and uh, we're not talking about another tour, we're talking about a presentation. And we decided that a presentation should be about something which is right now, which is the most contemporary of all. And this is a presentation about the uh, youth, the involvement, um, the action of the intelligence with the pandemic in Israel. Actually, the way the Israeli government uses the intelligence, intelligence and force uh to fight uh the COVID-19 so this presentation is going to happen very soon and it will be published for you but please stay tuned and uh we have the great speaker on this subject and the, he is a brigadier general uh reserve and he has quite a few other titles so uh well he will be introduced later but the presentation is already set and later if you if you wish we can have another presentation about um, the Ethiopian Jews. Thank you again, Nina, and You're thank welcome. you for your time. Thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for being you. Thank you, you Moti. What is the name yes. of the museum and exactly where it is? Pardon? Go to the website. Which website? It's www. .iicc.org.il and any questions if you have about in you can call me. Yeah, and then if you simply Google the Intelligence Heritage and commemoration center so you will get right to the website and then in that website you have plenty of information and all the needed links mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so well i hope you enjoyed the tour actually uh since i was not guiding i was more available to look at the chat and i saw that people were happy and interested thanks and our next uh next time we meet is this thursday and this Thursday is a presentation on a totally different subject. And we will be talking about agriculture. We will be talking about the history of the Israeli agriculture from the very primitive beginning to where it is, which is the high tech, cutting edge high tech of agriculture using a lot of brain rather than muscles. 
So this presentation will take place this Thursday. And uh, the speaker will be Noam Khidvati, a good friend of mine, uh, who is a tour guide and who is a kibbutznik. He uh, was born and raised in a kibbutz in Eng Shemer. And he was working in agriculture and he's back to farming because of the pandemic. So this is Thursday. And then Tuesday, next Tuesday, a week from today, we, um, what do we have there? Oh yeah, we have a wonderful presentation by Kineret Matan, and she will be talking about the Israeli contemporary art. So you're more than welcome. I think we're done. Any questions? Julia, Julia thank yes. you very much. Thank you so much for Nina and General David and Nidal for allowing us to stop in on their homes 7,000 miles away and listen to these fantastic stories that are uh, or in, or, or inspiring to all of us. And I'm sure we'll be in further contact with the organization and the presentation you mentioned about the Red Sea Diving Club is one I'm personally looking forward to. And we all should go it's see the movie name. again. Yes, and, and guys, this place, no matter how amazing it is, it is small and it needs your donations. I mean, this is an NGO and this is a nonprofit and uh, they need your support. So whoever feels like donating money for this heritage center, you're more than welcome to do that through EGAL and the information provided. So thanks. If they and donate, yeah, if they donate through PayPal, uh, they can be designated, I suppose. If they wanna donate through mailing a check to me, just designated for the intelligence Heritage Center, and I will see that they would get the money. Um, my my uh, mail address and so forth is mentioned in the invitation you would have received announcing the Zoom codes. Are there any questions at this point? Open forum, anybody have any issues? There was just um, a question from Elise. Jeanette Coven will be speaking next week. Is that what you said? Julia? Um, well, wait, uh, I, I've had a few things to say, so I will repeat. Uh, this Thursday, this Thursday, it is Yinon Khidvati about agriculture in Israel. And then Tuesday will be Kineret Matan about the contemporary Israeli art. And then Thursday will be a tour of, I guess, well, you know what? I'm not 100% sure. I think it is a tour of Megiddo, which is uh, otherwise known as Armageddon. So I think that's it, but I will double check. But uh, the next two events are um, the two presentations on two different topics. And I think it's gonna be Armageddon later. Thank you. Everybody who has signed up will receive a email giving them the Zoom codes. Should it be that you're not signed up and not receiving those Zoom codes in the, Zoom codes in the mail, I suggest that you send an email to VFI volunteer at gmail.com. Include your email address and the state you're in or the country and we will put you on a list and every Sunday you will receive an email telling you about the next week's programming. Again it's VFI volunteer at gmail.com. Any other issues on the table? I have one question. Um, are most of these being uh, recorded so that we can pick them up off the VFI um, site? Yes. yes. They're all being yeah. recorded. They'll first be on Julia's uh, Facebook page what? and then on the VFI what? YouTube. Please. Okay, because I'm starting school. My husband will continue. I'm going back to work one way <laughs> or another. I will miss you guys. This is absolutely amazing. Continue doing what you're doing. But my husband will stay with you guys. I, I will just have to watch all the recording. Great. Thank you, Thank you for joining us for a while and you're welcome to watch us um, anytime. Uh, I just, uh, I saw a question. Uh, the question was, uh, what is the difference between uh, Meir Amit Center and, and what? I lost the chat. And this museum, and this, this uh, memorial. Oh, uh, so actually uh, this place is a complex which has a few parts to it. One is the memorial and the other one is the uh, Meir Amit uh, Center. So uh, 
it, it is a complex which has different fractions to it. What, uh, what is Noam uh, studying when he starts his college next week? I'm uh, studying uh, computer engineering. Uh, ah, good engineering. man. Good man. All right. Yeah, well, he, he will be even better uh, technical support than he is yeah. now, and hopefully he will end up uh, with intelligence uh, forces when he joins the army. So, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe this uh, Zoom tour has to do with his future, or at least I hope so. We'll put in a good word. Oh, no, I'm uh, mazel, mazel tov. No, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> they need it. <laughs> yeah, Julia, can, yeah. Julia, can you give us the times that the tours will be? We don't want to double book with yeah, something yeah, else. Yeah, of course. Of course, we have first priority. <laughs> Julia's freezing, but uh, Hugo and Anita, you'll get it from us. Speak to the same All right, Julia. I will answer. So the presentation, the presentations are 9 p.m. Jerusalem time, which means 2 p.m. Eastern time, and the tours are normally 6 p.m. Jerusalem time, which is 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, for Megiddo, that will not be possible because this is a uh, national park and they close by five. So we will have to start earlier. Anita, you okay, will get the all the times in the emails that, that I send out. So don't worry about that. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I'm so happy to be your first priority. <laughs> Absolutely, it was wonderful. It always is. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Thank you all. And that was Steve Watkins' idea for us to be here. So, Steve, thank you. Well, thank you for carrying it out. It, it was uh, out of sight. Uh, for folks who uh, have friends who are not seeing this kind of information and you think they should, if you wish, you can also sign them up by sending an email to VFI volunteer at gmail.com with their email address and we'll put them on the list. No, nope. it's okay. Thanks, okay. Steve. Thank you. Have a Bye, wonderful everybody. day. Take care. Stay healthy. Bye. See you Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Rosa, do you have a question about VFI? Are you asking me? Yeah, I saw you had your hand raised. So I did. Um, um, about the Red Sea, uh, the, there's a good book out called Red Sea Spies, which, which is more accurate about what actually happened and how the Ethiopian Jews were the heroes. It is better than the movie. I recommend okay. people look it up, Red Sea Spies, Google it. Great. Thank you, Yosef. Okay. As someone who sounds like English but lives in Florida. <laughs> I'm not undercover. <laughs> I thought that okay. was a New York accent. What are you talking about? Go